Hey, it's Jack. And this video is called the number one thing that you can do in 2020 to attract true love. Hey, and welcome to the channel. If you're new or you haven't yet subscribed, just hit the subscribe button and tap the bell notification. I release at least two new videos every week on relationships and personal growth. And this is a super inspiring community to be part of and we'd love to have you with us. So hit subscribe, tap the bell notification and be on the journey. All right, so what is this number one thing that you can do in order to attract true love in 2020? Uh, this video is gonna be deep. So I'm gonna build this out over a few different contours. Hang in there with me because if you really get this, this is so powerful, not just for relationships, for your life at large, for the way you experience life, for the kind of ease or not that you can experience in your life. So the number one thing that you can do is learn how to trust life. Learn how to trust life. Now, let's break this down. So one of the ways that you can learn to trust life uh, is sometimes being described as the very place that you are in this moment, uh, God or life marked on a map with an X for you. And that is to say that <clears throat> the place that you're in right now is kind of by design that there is some intelligence behind it, that there is a path that life has for you, that is unfolding for you, and you're exactly where you need to be. Now, I remember when I first heard this, <laughs> I, I think I had a little bit of uh, surprise and probably uh, incredulity. I didn't really believe it because I was having a hard time. Who wants to hear when you're having a hard time, someone else who seems to be having less of a hard time saying to you, well, exactly where you are is exactly where you need to be, my friend. You know, this is all part of the bigger plan. And you're like, well, where I am right now is really painful. Like maybe you've just had a breakup. Maybe you've gone on 20 dates and nothing has materialized for you. Maybe you're up against the wall financially. Maybe you're ill right now. Maybe you're chronically ill. Maybe you're just feeling really down and depressed. I mean, there could be all sorts of things that are going on and true for you right now that would make it hard to imagine that anyone would have wanted to have it this way or design it for you. So if you're going through that, you know, my heart goes out to you. I know how hard it can be. Maybe I don't even know how hard it can be in your instance. Maybe you're experiencing something that I've never experienced. Um, but just to say, if in your moment of challenge, or this season of challenge, you can find a way to cultivate more trust for being exactly where you are. It will reap you huge dividends in times of life, seasons of life that are easier. So, you know, I often say this to myself and to clients, you know, when life is really challenging you, this is like an intense practice season. And that intense practice season, if you can come through it, you know, it's kind of like being bottom of the league and realizing that you have to uh, really muck in and then gradually your team, you get it together and you show up more and you train harder and you start getting results. And suddenly, little by little, you start rising up the league. That's what this might be a little bit like for you. Um, it's much easier to trust life when you feel the, the wind at your back, the sun shining on you that life is supporting you. Maybe you've just had a break. Maybe you've got uh, you know, a new career or maybe you've got a new relationship um, or maybe you've gotten through a health challenge. Could be all sorts of things that have it easier for you to feel like, oh, this is a benevolent universe. This universe is, is working for me. I mean, Einstein, no less than Einstein said, really the fundamental question we've got to ask is do we, do we think this is a kind universe or not? You know, do we, do we think that life is for us? or not. And some of this stuff, by the way, it runs really deep and really early in life. Like it, there can be a very early sense that develops in us as you know, what life is. You know, is life a good thing? Is life against us? Is life for us? Is life with us? Is life a safe place? Is it not a safe place? Some of this stuff is, you know, as early probably as attachment, right? And you can actually expand the concept of attachment to include life, you know, how attached are you to life? Do you experience life avoidantly? Do you experience life anxiously? 
do you experience life securely? You know, and of course, we probably move between these positions, but that can be an actually quite a fruitful inquiry because you may have some very, very unconscious or baseline assumptions about life that you didn't really decide or that maybe you haven't really challenged <laughs> that you just kind of inherited them or that was the consequence of your upbringing. And this might be an opportunity for you to review them. So look, one way that you can trust life and the benefits of trusting life are less resistance, less suffering, um, less pain, more ease, more relaxedness, more just a sense of like, oh, yeah, I'm in alignment. And again, this doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. You know, alignment might be, yeah, I'm in the river and actually we're getting thrown around by the eddies right now and we do have to go over that mini waterfall. That is exactly what we have to do. But my alignment is I'm not going to fight the river. I'm going to try and work with it, right? I'm going to try and use its own energy. I'm going to try and notice that paddling upstream is really hard. So it might be easier to align with the river, but it's not complete passivity. I still get to paddle. I don't just get to, you know remove my oar and just have the river take me exactly where it wants to take me. I'm going to align with this energy, but I might still rudder. I might still paddle really hard. I have my own desires. I have my own intuitions. So I'm fully online. I'm participating. I'm not a victim, but I'm aligning with life. So one way is the X on the map that I trust that where I am in this moment is right for me. The second thing might be that if you're like me and some of you, I imagine, have this experience your life might include the path of personal struggle, which means when I'm struggling, I don't have to disavow that I'm struggling. I don't have to disavow that I might be in pain or doubt or confusion or ambivalence, or I might be extremely afraid, or I might just be in lots of pain, you know, physically or otherwise, emotionally. I don't have to disavow that, but I might be able to hold it in a context which says, you know what, this pain... It may, may be something bigger at play. You know, when life really asks us to show up and work hard at something, may, maybe there is a payoff. And maybe you don't do it because of the payoff. Maybe you don't have any control over what the payoff looks like or when the payoff may come. But it's sort of a sense of hard work often does get rewarded in the fullness of time and sometimes in the strangest of ways. So if you're having a struggle about something, you know, and for a lot of us in this community, maybe a struggle has been in your love life, right? That you feel like you're in the same patterns of despair, frustration, confusion. Why does it always happen to me? Why does it work out like this? Where are all the good men? Why are all the men wounded? You know, you fill in the blanks of what would be true for you. But if you're having that experience, it might be that life is asking you to grow in ways that for other people, it's just not part of their path. Now, I'm not making that better, worse, superior, inferior. I'm just saying there might be an isness to it. It might be real. It might be that it's the case. And if it's the case, then better to embrace that that's the life that you have, that that's the hand that you've been dealt and realize that there's something incredibly powerful and beautiful in that hand. It's just that life will also take its pound of flesh at times that you may struggle, that you may want it to be easier or want it to be different. But a big part of trust is that you embrace the life that you have. Again, not pass passively. You can change things. You can show up. You can participate. You can be decisive. You can do all sorts of things. Set goals, have aims, have heart's desires. But there's sort of an embracing of, I don't wish that I had someone else's life. And by the way, you never know how other people struggle. I know this from coaching that... <laughs> You know, anything that looks really good and shiny on the surface when you dig deeper has normally got its own trauma and struggle. I think that's just called life. So you fully embrace it and you say, hey, this, this relationship area is kind of hard for me and I'm going to own that. And maybe I need to work harder. Maybe I need to work harder than my neighbors and my friends. You know, my friend who met her sweetheart in high school and married him at 22 and now they have four kids and a huge house and a very happy family and everything seems hunky-dory. Why is it so easy for her? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe her area of struggle isn't relationship. Maybe her area of struggle is something completely different. Maybe it's telling the truth. Maybe it's having deeper self-esteem. Maybe it's actualizing her career potential. Maybe it's freeing herself from needing to be admired and loved and liked by other people. You know, maybe it's some, maybe it's some other family karma, right? Sometimes people have a, a good immediate relationship and f an immediate family, but actually they're estranged from their mom or their dad or their sister or their brother. And that's actually their work. 
and they haven't even realized that yet. They're just in a narrative that, you know, mom or dad or brother is completely effed up and toxic and therefore I ignore them. But maybe that's going to be the path of the true healing, right? We call that go home. And there's a lot of stuff that I see put out by therapists even on Instagram and other platforms where the intuition that I have is, God, at some point I think you might have to go home because that's probably the path of the next layer of deeper healing, right? So no one has a free pass. You know, I call this the Prince William concept. Even Prince William doesn't have a free pass, right? The Prince Harry, we've seen that recently. You know, it's like maybe different challenges than you and I face in the day to day. Maybe you'd like some of those challenges, but maybe you actually have no idea what it's like to be on the inside of that. And maybe I don't either. So all of this is partly is about coming into full rapport, full alignment, full realization and trust of the path that you were on. Now you might say, well, how can I be on the right path, Jack? Because I've made some really crappy decisions. I made some really bad decisions that maybe cost me my relationship or cost me relationships with family members um, or cost me my job or I shouldn't have moved, I should have stayed in that town or I shouldn't have gone to that college or I should have kept up with my career in medicine. All of or any of those things could apply. And trust means that kind of at a soul level, I don't mean this in a spiritual bypass way, just at the deepest level, you maybe have some things that you're going to learn in this life, right? Could be love, freedom, authenticity, forgiveness, loss, renewal. You may have a sense already of what yours are. There may be good lessons that you haven't even come into yet in your life. And so if any of that is true, at the deeper level, or even if we just call it your arc of deeper development, you probably won't cheat yourself of a lesson, right? It'll come round. It'll come round again. It'll come round in a new relationship, in a new connection, or in a new opportunity. Or if you've struggled to hold on to money, maybe at some point you'll be given some money, or you'll make some money, or you'll inherit some money, and you'll be given another opportunity to see, well, what do you do with that? So the lessons, I think, often aren't just one and done, if they're really what you're here to learn, life will just keep knocking on that door in subtle ways and sometimes in gross ways. It won't be subtle that there's a lesson that you might need to learn or a place that you might need to relax and let go of. So another way that this can apply is by you fully trusting and embracing that the decisions you made in the past, whether they were great, good, average or bad, that you probably won't be missing out on some of your deeper lessons. And for some of us, really what that means is the fear is loss of guidance. It can sound like a fancy phrase. It means you know, loss of contact with higher self, that we fear being in a situation where we've got to make decisions and we've got no sense of should I go this path or that path, right? You may even have had this. I love trekking out in nature. Sometimes I get a little immersed. Sometimes I've gotten lost. And you're kind of standing. Maybe the sun's starting to set. It's getting colder. Survival instincts are starting to sit in, kick in. And you don't actually know which way to go. Maybe you feel like that sometimes in life where you're like, I really don't know which, which way to tread. And I've got a lot of anxiety. And I really fear that if I, basically, if I make the wrong decision, I might F my life up. That's sometimes the background fear for us, right? That we really fear, God, this is so consequential that... I don't know if I'll recover from making the wrong decision. You know, and of course, you might have some things in your life that are hugely consequential decisions. I don't want to diminish that. And you might notice that experience happens, even on the ones where perhaps it's not quite so consequential. You know, if you do or don't do something in your career or work at this season, maybe there'll be another season for it. You know, if you do or don't continue dating this guy, if he really wants to be with you, he can make that known. He might be able to come back round. You know, even that, and I had this in my experience with my wife now, is, you know, if it's really meant to be, I can turn this over. I don't necessarily have to hold all of my decisions. You know, there's a little bit of letting life into your decision making. We call it letting, letting life decide or what does life want for you. It's another way of trusting life is that you don't necessarily always have to be in the driver's seat in every situation. 
you don't necessarily always have to know what the right path is, what the right decision is. Sometimes it comes to you via in, in, intuition. Sometimes it ca- comes via a flash of inspiration. Sometimes it comes because you made the wrong decision and life reopens a door and has you notice something about what's there. You know? So I, I even back in the day can remember a friend saying that to me like, huh, yeah, if life really wants you guys to be together, it will, it will come around. There'll be, there'll be an opening, an opportunity. And boom, at a certain point, several years ago now, but there was. That, that, that kind of came around. Things aligned for us to actually spend time together and to see what was there and to explore things. And in a way that I probably couldn't have just made happen myself. Of course, my participation was required. But there's also a sense of listening, trusting, yielding, attuning, noticing, receiving guidance. It's like living from a slightly different place. That is a way that a lot of us experience trust because said differently, it's very hard to experience trust when you're up in your head trying to figure everything out. You might be seen as smart by other people. You might be awesome on your productivity apps or you might be super mum and juggling you know, 27 things at once. That's all well and good. You can have huge capacity and competence. Awesome, totally respect that. And it might be that in terms of can you actually trust your life? Can you trust that when you let go and relax that actually something is holding you, that life is bigger than you, that you don't have to have it all figured out, that you don't have to try and prove to the world that you've got it all figured out, that you don't have to always optimize for everything in your life and optimize every single decision, that actually there's a place that is deeper than that and more knowing than that it's often for a lot of us it's a slower place and that when you have that slower place how you live your life is kind of different and for most of us what is that called it's called inner work right it's called inner work of relaxing into letting life hold us trusting that life has something in store for us often that life has plans in store for us Right? Some people call that divine plan or life at our back or call it what you will. It's just this sense that life sometimes has bigger ideas for you than you have for yourself. And that part of maturing may be that you drop some of your self-idealizations, right? these notions you have of your ideal self. Like if I were my ideal self, I would you know, go to the gym this many times, or I would have written my book, or I would be making this much money in my career, or I would have this kind of relationship, or I drive this kind of car, or I would be respected in this kind of way. Kind of drop some of those ideas and say, hey life, why don't you show me? And maybe it's not the, the frame of the ideal self. Maybe it's just like, what do you want me to be? Where do you want me to show up? How do you want me to serve? Why did you incarnate me? What's, what's my reason for being what's up (laughs) you know it's like you you, you're having the conversation from a different place and not one that i need the answers not one that i should have the answers not one where my inner critic comes through the back door and tells me why have i achieved so little or i should have achieved more i should have had a relationship by now it's like yeah you're on an individuated path no one's path is going to be exactly the same as yours we can all support one another we can learn from one another and there's going to be something that is unique and precious and special and authentic about your path and that we want to know about that and that life has ins- installed that in you or incarnated you or guided you or even just given you a whole lot of tough love through some really challenging life circumstances you know sometimes i hear of people's life circumstances i'm like wow I can't even imagine what that might be like, you know, incredible loss or incredible heartache or incredible physical suffering. And I know a little about that from some chronic physical suffering, but there's there's levels, right? And yeah, you wonder what's that all about? And then noticing, huh, and this, this is still, there's something precious beating at the heart of this life. And that's what trusting life is, noticing, you know, life might have in store for you that you have eight failed marriages. I don't know. Life might have in store for you that you're actually never in relationship. I don't know. It's like what, what happens if you can relax that need to know or the need to control or the need to have that figured out and actually kind of show up with a little bit more of what's here for me. 
what's here for me? There's something precious about learning about the pain of not being in relationship. There's something precious about getting your heart broken and unrequited love. I'm not saying that the human in you is going to level these experiences. It might be excruciating, but there's something precious about that. Some people don't know what heartache is like, so they can't read Rumi and really understand the longing. Or they don't know what it's like for someone who got broken up with three years ago and they're still struggling to get over it, right? That's really human and it's also precious. It's also something that not everyone is having that experience. And so there's another form of trust, which is called trusting your experience, right? If you can trust life, you can trust your experience that the experience you're meant to be having right now is maybe the experience you're meant to be having. And that it's okay that you might be in a cycle of frustration or longing or unrequited love or not knowing which way to turn or not knowing where to rest your head at night. That maybe all of those things can be okay and they only get easier if we don't resist them. You know, oftentimes what's hard about life is not necessarily just our primary experience, right? So the primary experience could be I'm in physical pain. Or the primary experience could be... Uh, my heart is aching or my head is throbbing or I feel like there's a fog of confusion that's surrounding my head. That might be your primary experience. Often we can bring it down to the sensational, the level of the senses and the emotional. What are you feeling? And then there's a secondary experience, which is where a lot of the pain is amplified or sometimes created. And the secondary experience is my interpretation of that, right? My resistance to that my frame on that. This shouldn't be happening. Why is this happening to me? Why does this always happen to me? Why do I always get abandoned? Why does no one love me? That's like the mental overlay or the perspective overlay, again, kind of a cool echo in this underpass. That's the thing that's often really painful for us, right? It's not actually that if we just said, hey, just slow down and as best you can, even if it's really difficult, be with that physical sensation notice what it's like. And you might say, well, why do I want to do that, Jack? This physical sensation happens every single day, happens most hours of every day, or I've had it for three weeks now. I don't want to. Part of trusting life is that if life is still giving you some of that information, maybe there's something in it for you. And maybe it's something that you and I couldn't have even imagined, right? That is part of trusting life, that if you're still in a certain kind of pain about something, it might be there's something that's going to shift or release, or you just haven't found that connection or communication with your body yet, or it might be, yeah, part of your path is going to be learning how to live with a certain amount of physical discomfort and pain. It might be part of your path is learning how to live with a certain amount of emotional discomfort or emotional pain. And it might be that one day it unwinds. It's like, do you see there's a part of trusting life is, you know, when you go to the movies, you don't have to get too worried about how the movie works out, right? You might have some desires and some hopes. You might want the guy and girl to get together, or you might want the villain to be fallen. You might want a particular unfolding of the movie, but you don't actually need to worry about it because the movie's going to unfold and you get to enjoy it. It's a little bit more of that orientation to your own life. That You don't have to know all the outcomes. You don't have to know all the ways of doing things. You just sometimes have to keep showing up, paying attention, tracking, noticing. What's being called for here? What am I being asked for? Oh, wow, I'm still in pain. So maybe I need to spend more time with myself and actually sit with and be with myself. Oh, I'm still in heartache and it's been months. Maybe I need to slow down and sit with myself and really be with this pain, not with my impatience around the pain, not with my indifference to the pain, not with my rejection of the pain, but my actual acceptance and being with of the pain. You know, in neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, which I, it's not a core modality for me, but it's something that I've, I first started to get curious about in my teenage years. So I, I've been in and around it. And one of the things they talk about in NLP is present state acceptance and really being in rapport with, being in alignment with what is actually happening right now before we look to change it, right? It's sort of like getting true and honest to this moment before we try and escape or change into some other moment. That is a really powerful principle, the principle of actually really being with your experience. And sometimes if we get honest or get curious, 
and I'll, I'll just own this myself, right? From times that I've had, still I have at times physical pain. And I can be like, oh my God, I've seen everyone in the world about this. I've been to body workers and rolfers and Reiki practitioners and neuromuscular releases and masses and physical therapists. And you can add a lot of people onto that list. So you can add a lot of people onto that list. And maybe I've had that experience, but that doesn't necessarily mean that through every one of those experiences, I've actually just accepted where I'm at or that any one of those experiences was meant to quote, solve the problem, right? It might be that it's a deeper, longer journey than that. It may be that a lot of this is about, and I have had this experience, teaching me presence. If you're in physical pain, it's a calling to be present. And often we don't want to be present with the pain, right? You might have your own experiences. Maybe yours is emotional and heartbreak. And you don't actually want to feel that because you think it's going to destroy me. I'll never not feel it. I'll be so sad. I'll become an amoeba, a blob, and I'll never do anything again with my life. You know, maybe all sorts of narratives that you've overlaid that may or may not actually be true. Part of trusting life is, huh, life is always going to be giving you some stuff. Some of it you'll like, some of it you won't. What does it take to accept it? Doesn't mean you can't have your desires and still make requests for the things that you want, particularly when they're heart desires over time that feel true and real and authentic to you but that you stop rejecting your experiences. And this, of course, can be very subtle. That's what I'm trying to point to, that you might say, well, I felt the pain of releasing this guy, or I felt the pain of him breaking up. I've been crying, I've been crying, I've been crying. That might be true. That might be hats off to you that you've had the courage to do that. And it might be that the pain that you're feeling isn't just the physical and emotional pain of the moment. You're experiencing a constant kind of re-picking of your old wound or a little bit of a re-traumatizing of your old wound because a lot of where you go is into what did I do wrong right why does no one love me why does no one stick with me like you've spun off into a whole set of questions and fears that aren't actually to do with fully feeling perhaps the primary experience which might be sadness and loss Maybe you've got to burn through some anger first, right? You feel angry perhaps that someone broke up with you or that you thought the connection was going somewhere and actually it hasn't. But once you really burn through that, you get in contact with the core emotion there, which for most of us is sadness. Sadness at what won't be. Sadness that you missed someone. Sadness that you missed a part of you that perhaps showed up so beautifully in that connection that that's the thing that we want to get to you know so part of trusting life is that if life keeps giving you an experience that you don't just keep rejecting it and if you do you'll often keep it in place unconsciously that's kind of the irony of this you know it's why if you've seen my videos before on heartbreak I encourage people to block out time get slow and feel because otherwise you might be feeling a form of this ongoingly for a long time because you never really got to it with a deeper level of being withness and acceptance. And how this often shows up is impatience, frustration, self-criticism, avoidance, staying busy, getting busy with other things, taking yourself out and going on tons of activities or tons of new dates, just ways to avoid being with the thing that's at the core of your life, that life is saying, hey, we need you to look at this because life does include loss. There's no way of getting around that. And that loss doesn't have to be tragedy. Loss can also be beautiful. To experience the poignance of a broken heart. The poignance of your lost soul. The tenderness of... I don't even know where to go from here. The tenderness and the humility of having your worldview shattered. And your sense of self shattered or your sense that you know where something's going maybe your basic trust right to loop back to right where we started is the universe a good and kind place does it have your back you might be like hell no it doesn't because i'm in so much pain or i had invested in this guy and he's just ripped my world apart and you want me to trust what are you some crazy guy (laughs) maybe (laughs) maybe um but maybe also, you know, life is, co- is calling you to something different. You know, I've heard this explained through the metaphor of, uh, you know, you receiving mail. Um, so you're receiving mail 
and the male in this instance, the letter is your experience. So you're getting given an experience by life. And if every time you cross it out and say, you know, return to sender, you know, you're basically rejecting your experience, right? That you're every time you're saying, no, nope, not meant to be experiencing this. I know best, not meant to be having this experience. This isn't the way it's meant to go. This isn't what I'm meant to be feeling. You know, an authentic orientation to your feelings is, what am I feeling right now? It doesn't have a commentary about, should I be feeling this? Why am I so tired right now? Why, why am I so tired? Let me invest a lot of time in analyzing why I'm tired. Trusting life says, I'm tired right now. I'll go rest. And of course, right in certain circumstances, you're like, come on, I can't go rest. I've got to, you know, feed the kids or I've got to run my personal errands or I've got to make some money today. Of course, we all have to be doing some of those things at some times. But you get the flavor of it, right? That you're not wasting more energy. When you're tired, if you're going to put more energy into trying to analyze in that moment, why am I tired? What did I do wrong? It's kind of like you have an impatience with your own tiredness rather than a trusting of your tiredness that says, yeah, energy shifts, energy moves. Sometimes I'm going to be energized. Sometimes I'm going to be tired. Sometimes I'm going to wish I had more energy. Sometimes I'm going to be overflowing with energy. Like all of those are life experiences. And your job is to welcome the experience. You know, similar thing with emotions. You know, watch emotions knocking on the door. You open the door, you notice, oh, okay, joy. Yes, you can come in. Thanks for visiting today. And you get another knock at the door. What's, what's going on? Oh, it's grief. Grief, come in. You're welcome. All right, you sort of have a welcomeness to your different feelings and your experiences. That's part of trusting life. It's kind of like the movie of life is happening. You don't have to always decide the denouement. You just have to get with the movie and notice. And of course, this runs in the face of people that want to create their emotional experiences, right? If you're like, well, I want to only experience joy in my life and I'm going to structure my life that way. That's cool. You can do that. I just don't know that at a certain level of development, that's what people really want. If you want the authentic life, I think you sometimes have to step out of that sense of control because often when people only want to experience joy, what does it mean? It means they haven't come into right relationship and deeper rapport and acceptance of the quote negative emotions that they don't want to experience pain, loss, longing, disappointment, sadness, frustration, anger, rejection, unrequited love. You go on. But if we hold that that is all part of the tapestry of life, right? There is no birth without death, that there is no renewal without going down the valley first, that these are all cycles and part of life, then we don't want to exclude half of our lives and avoid ourselves. And just think of the energy that that takes, right? For most of us, if we're going to suppress, repress, avoid, dissociate, it's all energy that it's taking, you know, where we're divorcing ourselves from our own vitality and essence and life force. So that's why you might want to not do that. So part of trusting life is you trust the experiences that life brings you. You trust what life has in store for you. You don't necessarily have to trust your own mental analysis and commentary about what life is bringing you. Some people, their path might be really about building a whole lot of financial abundance. For some people, their life might be building a whole lot of financial abundance and then having to experience the loss of that. For some people, you know, maybe money's not quite so much of a thing. Maybe it's like, yeah, sometimes I have more, sometimes I might have less, but it's not really like a preoccupying factor. It's not really where your big path and journey is going to be. For some people, it's the heart of their path and journey. So part of trusting life is that you actually trust your own individuation. You trust the authenticity of your path. That you don't have to spend quite so much time worrying about other people's paths. You can bless them, get curious, champion them. But just because someone has experienced a certain thing doesn't mean that you need to. Just because someone's had a lucky break doesn't mean that you need to. Just because someone's in a position of power doesn't mean that you need to. Do you see there's a kind of freedom there, freedom to be you, where you spend less time worrying about other people less time worrying about what they've achieved or not. And really, you just bring it very much home to yourself. It's almost like a more personal relationship with life or God that's like, this is about you and your path. Of course, we're in this together. Of course, we're you know, noticing that right now with this 
global pandemic that we're deeply interconnected in ways that I'm sure I don't understand. And when it comes to your path, there is something that is somewhat solo in that for a lot of us, right? That there's, by, maybe that's not even the best way of saying it, just that there is a uniqueness to your path. And part of that is trusting your uniqueness, you know? So when a teacher says, these are the things that you need to do in order to achieve a particular result, part of you might just want to get curious, how true is that going to be for me? Does that match the uniqueness of my path? Now, getting so unique on your path can sometimes mean that you don't think you need to be open to anyone or any feedback or any input. I'm not sure that that's quite the truth of it. <laughs> but I have seen a lot of people trying to model someone where my noticing is, wow, even just at an archetypical level, you don't seem that like this person. So it might be that they're inspiring you, but actually they could also, as true, be talking to your inner critic that has now gotten activated and is now starting to beat yourself up that you, you know, haven't yet made the money, done the thing, built the thing, got the relationship, got the diet, got the body, you know, fill in the blanks. And I'm all for people being inspired towards, you know, a deeper calling, a richer, truer, more authentic version of themselves. It's just, in my experience, doesn't come from your, I'm trying to block the sun out here, it doesn't come from your inner critic telling you that you need to be better, stronger, deeper, richer. It might come from a truer heart place than that structure, which is really, you know, the inner critic is really a structure of socialization. It's a structure to keep you safe and complying and becoming a civilized member of society, hopefully. It's a really important developmental structure but in my experience, that developmental structure, at some point we need to learn to relax it because it doesn't necessarily have our truest calling and our deepest heart's desire and soul's yearning as its message. It normally has, how can I keep being a good little boy or a good little girl so that mommy and daddy like and approve of me or so that other people like and approve of me? Um, and how can I curb some of my most basic drives and instincts and there's something good about that that keeps us safe keeps us not you know beating one another up and there's a lot of energy that that structure suppresses and it's not your heart's desire so just getting clear about where certain things are coming from in you trusting life is that you don't have to model someone else's path because your path up the mountain is going to be what unique to you so be open, receptive, take advice, guidance, but notice where it lands in you. Notice if it seems like it's path, part and parcel of your path and your authenticity, uh, rather than imagining that the ideas and answers lie in someone else. Because when you do that, it makes it harder to trust life. Because you're kind of saying, oh, life, let me outsource my guidance to someone else. Let me imagine that someone else knows more about my path. Let me imagine that someone else knows more about what I'm meant to be doing or not doing. And just try that out for yourself. My experience is that that isn't necessarily true. Of course, in a domain-specific way, someone might know more about health or breakups or diet or building a business. Absolutely. And we always just want that checking back in with yourself to notice, does that really ring true? to me? Does that land in me as something that is increasing my trust for myself and for life? You know, learning how to trust life is a big project for most of us, right? I have been lucky to work with and be in contact with a lot of people, a lot of people who are part of, you know, personal growth, inner work, spiritual development communities. And it's not that many people, including myself, a lot of times that I meet that have a deep trust for life, that have a deep knowing that their path is right. I notice a lot of people sort of talk that, preach that, but, but from my observation of, huh, where's this life actually being lived from, you know, sometimes that can easily become spiritual bypass, right? It can become, uh, I don't actually take good care of myself. I don't actually show up and work hard. Um, until I feel inspired to, but I sort of notice that actually I don't feel that inspired to do that that often. 
Um, sometimes I get taken off in my own emotional fantasies, down my own emotional rabbit holes. So there's a lot of times that spiritual speak can talk the language of trust and love, but whether it deeply matches the place that life is being lived from, or that it includes that uh, sometimes, oftentimes life is also painstaking, detail, admin, to some of the bare necessities of life. It isn't all upwards and inspired and, uh, you know, turned on, right? Some of life is downward and dirty and muddy and messy and confusing and, you know, learning how to be with all that whilst we seek the place to trust more. You know, basically saying trust isn't avoiding the fact that you have doubts or concerns or fears. It's just not taking those things as the place that you want to live your life from. But if you're never in touch with that, if you're always so sort of uh, spiritually enamored and taken by these kind of ecstatic states of experience, there's normally what I see is under that, there's a lot of stuff that's just not really getting looked at. So it's like, oh, you can trust life when you're having an experience of your heart being blown open or that you feel super inspired or in communion with God or an experience of oneness with all of us. Awesome. Awesome. And can you trust life when you have no ability to figure out your own tax return? Or can you trust life when you notice that you're actually overdue on your taxes and you didn't even realize? Or can you trust life when you feel bogged down by 337 emails that you haven't opened? Or can you trust life when you're tired and hungry and you go to the cupboard and you haven't got any food in there? Or can you trust life when you're running out of money and you don't really know which way to turn? But those are perhaps better petri dish tests of how much you can trust life than just when you're kind of on the up and in, in the uh, highness as it were, of your deeper spiritual experiences. Does that make sense? It's kind of saying another way of trusting life is that you don't just trust life when you feel good and then start preaching at people spiritually about how we should all feel good and be joyful and peaceful and wonderful. It's like, actually, can you trust life in your darkest moments, right? That's, that's a really important place. Can you trust life when it's not going your way? So much easier for all of us to trust life when we feel good and feel like it's going our way or even that life is showing up in the way that we had expected so actually what we're trusting is ourselves that this kind of ideas or ideal life that we have but we're not trusting life when it gives us lemons and we wanted lemonade right that that's actually the place to go to work to notice huh what happens then do I go down on myself do I get depressed you know because one way of talking about a mild form of depression is that it's the difference between how you thought things were going to go and how they're actually showing up. And, you know, what happens when you have that experience? Maybe when you have that experience, this is the place that you want to dig deeper. So, you know, all of this to say, notice the places that you struggle, notice the places that you find hard, and notice if they are opportunities calling you to include that in the context of trusting life. The part of trusting life is that it will sometimes feel limited, painful, frustrating, and will have more admin than you wish it had. That that is a part of life for most of us. Now, we can sometimes get around that by having executive assistants or having work colleagues or having someone else come around and do the cleaning or paying someone to Uber you. I mean, there's all sorts of hacks that might be great from the perspective of personal productivity whether they're so effective from the place of having you trust, I'm not so sure. If you've never gotten a relationship with detail and painstakingness and treacle, things going really slowly when you want them to go a lot faster, you can outsource that. But you can't outsource the spiritual lesson, I think. You can't outsource that that has you, whenever life gets slow and sticky, just wraps up your frustration, you're in resistance that you can't actually be with things. I remember reading M. Scott Peck. You probably know this book, The Road Less Traveled, and then The Road Less Traveled 2. I remember I was reading it actually in a minibus. I was with my then business partner um, from London, but we were traveling in Morocco. Very cool holiday. It's kind of like we'd worked hard all year and we decided we'd break the British winter, which in my experience is a good idea. 
and get a little bit of uh, sun and, as it happens, some snow uh, in Morocco. Anyway, so I'm reading this book in the minibus and M. Scott Peck is talking about uh, fixing his car and that whenever he had something a problem with his car, even though he's super smart guy, you know, PhD, multiple time author, teacher, professor, all all the, all the stuff, psychiatrist, that he doesn't have the interest to be able to figure out basically simple manual things. Like why is his seat jammed? And maybe there's some complex reason, but maybe it's the kind of thing that actually, if you spend just a couple of minutes figuring around, looking, noticing, you know, what impacts what or what lever or cog impacts what in the system, this is something that you could probably work out. And it really dawned on me that I had never shown any interest in that kind of stuff. Now it happens I grew up with, you know, two parents who are pretty detail oriented and pretty good at figuring that sort of stuff out. And I've been more on the cerebral intuitive side. So that's not my core strength. You know, my sort of introverted thinking or engineering brain isn't my, isn't my strongest ability, certainly historically. And then I kind of noticed, huh, this might be the edge of development for me. Rather than just being the guy who can be like, oh yeah, there's a problem with my car, I know who to call. Again, from a business perspective, from a life and leverage perspective, that's pretty cool. Get on the phone, know your strengths, play to them. But from a spiritual wholeness, true path, right relationship with life perspective, that may encourage something very different right? That may encourage that we actually need to get down and dirty and be with the things that we find it hard to be with. And I've done this with clients where I've suggested that they work on this stuff and it can really pay dividends because it can shift your relationship with life. It basically teaches you to notice where are the places that you get frustrated, where you lack patience, Because what we know about frustration and patience is oftentimes they don't just show up around a car seat that gets jammed that you can't move or fix. They also show up in relation to yourself. They also show up in relation to your partners or potential partners. Like that is just a theme of reality that probably runs through your life. So notice part of getting on board with trusting life might be that I I learn how to be more fully with different types of experiences. Because my inner work journey of trusting more is going to be a lot easier if I don't deal with a lot of frustration and patience myself. Now, authenticity dictates that when you are experiencing frustration, limitation, boredom, authenticity dictates, let's feel that. Let's notice it. So I don't have to pretend that when I'm frustrated, I know I'm not frustrated. I'm good. No, I'm frustrated right now. So when the experience arrives, be with it. But notice what happened before the experience. What happened before the experience was your car seat jammed. And rather than maybe just taking one, three or five minutes, just noticing, is it something that I can figure out? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Or is it kind of automatic that when life puts things in my path that I don't like, I just quickly go to frustration? If it is the case, then my inquiry for you is when you start having an emotional or physical experience internally that you don't like, Is it quick for you to go to frustration? Is it quick for you to go to impatience? If you don't think things are moving fast enough, if you don't like your meditation, if you don't think you're growing spiritually fast enough, if you think you are tired when you actually don't wanna be tired, or if you think that you're in pain when you shouldn't be in pain, you fill in the blanks for your own life, but notice if there's a kind of impatience, however subtle, that undergirds that, that underpins that, and that's having you experience it. Because, If that's true, that's gonna be probably your barrier to trusting life, is that when you have more difficult experiences, you probably go to impatience and frustration rather than perhaps a place of, huh, what about if I trust this? What about if I trust that this is a limitation that I actually am encouraged to be with? I'm basically contrasting be with itness, be with the experience, befriend it, notice it, attune to it, welcome it, rather than reject the experience which means be impatient with it, be frustrated with it. Similar thing, I'm not a parent, but maybe you are. I I do have uh, lots of nieces and nephews. If you're around young kids and they're having a difficult experience, maybe they're having a tantrum, if you're resourced enough, it might be that you can actually be with them and get curious about what's up. Like, 
is there a, a physical need? Is there a request here that can't be voiced? Like, tell me what you need. What do you need? That that might be a better way of orienting to the situation than being frustrated with it or wishing it were different. Because that probably just keeps it in place. It probably keeps you in a place of frustration and patience. It probably means that next time it happens, that's gonna be your go-to route. So part of trusting life is that we notice at the subtlest level what is happening between us and our experience? Is there a welcomeness? Is there a welcome to our experience? Can we host our experiences? Can we trust life is giving me this experience? Or is there a subtle resistance, a subtle rejection, a subtle sense of it shouldn't be happening like this? Now, you may say, well, what about if someone's attacking me? You know, do I just have to welcome that experience? No, because notice, probably, if you're being attacked, the part of your system is also coming on board, known as uh, fight or flight, or also part of your system may be coming on board, known as anger, that says, hey, get, get away from me, stop that, or fight back, right? So it's like we have these mechanisms um, within us normally to keep us safe, right? And that's not saying that, you know, you might have had experience where you tried to keep yourself safe and you weren't able to. You know, all of that can still sit within this context of, huh, maybe there's something in here for me. Maybe there's something for me to notice about speaking up or having my voice or claiming my power or claiming my boundaries. That normally when life gives us a difficult experience, there is something like that within this. Now, last point that I'm going to make on this video. There's there's some subtle territory with this last piece, which is not everything you will be able to find the reason for, right? So if you're more inclined to a spiritual life perspective, you might want to know that when you've had a bad accident or illness or tragedy or misfortune, you might want to know what the blessing in disguise is, right? You might want to know that, oh, well, that happened for this reason because it brought this person into my life or it showed me that my career wasn't actually really for me or it revealed this true colors of this person who I thought was a good friend and, and now they're not. Sometimes it might be obvious. Sometimes, you know, that which surpasses us, our understanding, it might be that it's above our pay grade, right? Or that it's just not known yet, or that the fullness of the cycle will need to be revealed for us to, to notice what it might have been about. And still then, it may just be an idea. We may not know for certain, right? So part of this becomes that you can look for the deeper meanings in life, but you're not attached to them. That that's not some kind of subtle crutch that that every time you have a bad experience, you can be with it because you know what the payoff is. That sometimes you might want to learn just how to be with a bad experience or a difficult experience for what it is. You know, it's almost like being able to do a hard workout at the gym without having to know that you, you know, in- improved your bicep size or trumped your personal best. It's like actually that you can be with a difficult experience in and of itself because that will give you a huge amount of freedom and it will also stop your mind going in overdrive, trying to wonder, well, what's this about? What is this about? Why would this have happened to me? What's the uh, silver lining here? What's the deeper meaning? Sometimes for those of us that are more attuned to the upside of life, right, who find it easier to be with the positive experiences of joy and peace and happiness and laughter, and we find it more difficult to be with the experiences of sadness and loss and limitation, this can be a sort of subtle spiritual bypassing move that we get very good with our now spiritual perspective of working out, oh, what was the blessing in disguise? Part of the true teaching of blessings in disguise is you don't need to know. You don't need to know in the moment. You let it be revealed. You don't have to necessarily go looking for it cerebrally. You, you, you can let it wash over. You can notice, huh, yeah, this could be because of this, could be because of that. But there's no need to know. There's no attachment to having to know or that every experience has to give you some kind of yummy spiritual lesson, right? That there's actually the freedom to have an experience and almost shrug your shoulders. Not that you're detached from life, but just, I'm humble enough. I don't know. I'm curious. I don't need to go looking. Let it be revealed, let it be shown. Maybe there's a huge life lesson. Maybe there's a micro life lesson. Maybe there's zero life lesson. Maybe not everything has to always be a lesson and that that can be a subtle form of our own need to know or our own desire to stay in control, right? Because it's much more easy to feel in control when you're like, well, I know why this is happening. And hey, I'm not just preaching 
to the choir here. I am in the choir here. I know that experience in myself where my ability to move quickly through multiple perspectives, which is a gift in many ways, can sometimes be my own limitation that I'm, I'm looking and I'm wanting to know. But at my best, I can relax that and notice I don't necessarily need to know that a true blessing in disguise, this is actually, this is a book of some of Osho's teachings where Osho, this is a, it's not actually a Osho derived teaching. I think it probably comes from possibly Zen Buddhism. I'm not sure about that. Um, but the teaching of blessings in disguise is, you know, it's a, it's a guy and his, he's with his family and his son and his son has an accident. I think he falls off a horse and he breaks his leg. And everyone is like, wow, that's so unfortunate. And he says, maybe. And then the country decides to go to war and all the young men get taken and conscripted into the war. But his son doesn't. Why? Because he's got the broken leg. People say, wow, you're so fortunate. And he says, maybe. You know, in a, in a way, it's, it's actually teaching non-attachment to uh, needing to know or non-attachment that every difficult experience has to have a positive one. It's sort of like if there's a silver lining, enjoy it, but you're not attached that there needs to be a silver lining. So if you stayed this far, thank you so much for being with me in this video. I appreciate it. Please like and subscribe to the channel. I'd love to have you with us. And also, if you've liked what you've heard in this video, you'll like my Real Freedom Guide. It's my free guide. You can just click the first link beneath this video. And it's a guide about how to be free to be you. And it's got some deeper perspectives and I've gotten good feedback from it. So just click the link, download it. We'll send, you, send it to your email. It also will put you on my email list so that you hear of anything that I've got going on. Um, I am gonna be launching some new programs here shortly. So keep an eye out for that. And as always, I'm Jack. Thanks for being here.